companies have obtained for project funding to be defer to be used for relief funding. It has to be deferred. Now, they, if there is no relief for the interim period, it renders arts groups in serious financial challenges, with some of them now permanently shut down. How on earth are companies who have literally been forced to shut down even be able to create any kind of work in a deferred state? The largest number of uh, theater workers in South Africa are freelancers and hence do not even qualify for unemployment benefits as a result of the lockdown. The art sector has been resilient at initiating several relief efforts from its own relief, from its own resources to support colleagues in the industry. And this goes from organizing food schemes amongst artists themselves to efforts which include relief provided by the Feed, Feed, Feed the Crew initiative, initiatives driven by the, the Wordfields Festival and efforts by the Theatre Benevolent Fund. Now, Honorable Chairperson and Honorable Members of this committee, I want it to be noted that the Theatre Benevolent Fund is a registered charitable trust with more than three decades of an accountable and a reliable track record of providing relief efforts to the theatre sector. The Theatre Benevolent Fund would have been an effective structure to disseminate relief for the sector. Unlike persons appointed by the minister who sit on the councils of cultural institutions and drain these institutions of hundreds of thousands of rands per annum for their poor governance of these institutions, all the members of the Theatre Benevolent Fund since the charity's inception more than three decades ago have rendered their services voluntarily, professionally, and accountably. And yet the DSAC has not even engaged the Theatre Benevolent Fund to identify destitute artists or to channel funding to destitute artists through what is a registered, a legitimate, a credible, and an accountable charity fund. The DAC's response is that the sector needs to work through SIFSA. This is a federation created by the DAC for the sector. Now, honorable chairperson and members of the committee, I want to point out in this regard that, the, that SIFSA, which has been established by the DAC, has been rejected by the vast majority of our sector on the premise that, and we call on the select committee to un fully understand this, that our rejection of SIFSA is largely because of their lack of accountability for public funds which they have received from the DAC, and for which, since the existence, they have not provided a single audited report. And we call on the select committee to institute despite SIFSA's dismal record for a lack of accountability of public funds. With that, I leave you, Chairperson. Thank you very much. Good, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Ms. Karabo Kokong. I'm a theatre producer based in Mahikeng, Northwest Province. I am the chairperson of um, for the Arts and Industry Lobbying Movement of the Artists, which was initiated by the opera singer Ms. Bongile Goma on Facebook in January 2020. We are now a formalized constitutional organization with over a thousand registered individual members and sitting over 18,000 members on Facebook. I'm also a member of the Theater and Dance Employers Association, TDEA, an organization initiated by the heads of the Baxter Theater and Magnet Theater, respectively, during this COVID-19 era and out of a dire need to ensure the sustainability of the ecosystem of the theater and dance sectors in South Africa. This association now has representatives across the country. I'm aware, Chairperson, that one doesn't have much time allocated, so I'll try to be as brief as possible, as also my colleagues will also touch on other matters uh, which I intended to, to, to touch on. I think it's safe to say, honorable members, that the underlining big picture of the creative industry is the biggest challenge our sector is facing, the challenge of having a custodian does, that does not listen to us, the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture. The fact that in recent months, artists have taken to the streets to protest against the department is indeed telling of how frustrated the sector is. From the Durban-based um, march, artist march, uh, to the national march at Union Buildings in Pretoria, one common cry 
One common cry there was for the relief beyond the funds. We need our voices to be heard. It is no secret, colleagues, that many artists couldn't access the artist relief funds due to many restrictions set out as criteria by the department. Many organizations, including Am for the Arts and TDEA, have on numerous occasions tried to call upon the department to acknowledge that ours is of a gig economy structure, and therefore many artists could, could not or would not have the required documents like your proof of income, tax clearance certificates, and all the other difficult documents to acquire, more especially during the different levels of the national lockdown. The TDAA, as an example, had proposed that the department works through the employers to reach thousands of artists who we had employed over the past 36 months, I think. But this too fell on deaf ears. This would have minimized all the red tapes as most employers are most compliant than the individual freelancers we have populating our sector. As a relatively new but legitimate movement, of the artists, Arm for the Arts has six duly elected provincial reps across the country who, when given a chance, would come here and tell you how much artists are suffering on the ground. Even after going at pains to highlight the unhappiness that the sector has with a structure that my colleague Ismail has referred to, STIFSA, which has failed to account for all the public money spent on it, the department and various provincial uh, department of arts and culture for that matter want to force us into a, into a marriage. We are here honorable members crying out for help, asking you to know that there's a growing dissonance and distrust between the DCLC and the theater and dance sector, which we believe has resulted from the department's failure at effective communication, poor administration, and the dismal understanding of the dynamics of this sector. Now, before I hand over to my colleague, Daniel Galloway, to lead you through his presentation, I, I would just like to reiterate that, colleagues, indeed, our sector is on its knees, honorable members. More artists are now calling for more resistance and protests, and therefore, your intervention as the select committee would be most appreciated. I do not want to waste more time. Like I said, other colleagues will touch to depth other points that we, we want to raise. I'd like to pause here for now. Thank you. Daniel? Thank you uh, very much, Karabo. Good afternoon, honorable chairperson, honorable members of the select committee and my fellow industry professionals. Uh, thank you for inviting me for my input at this meeting as it relates specifically to the independent theater sector using the Fugard Theatre as a specific example. My name is Daniel Galloway, and for the past 10 years, I've been the managing director and producer of the Fugard Theatre in Cape Town, a fully independent theatre. Fugard, despite its best efforts over the decade, received no other form of funding, subsidy, or grant. After almost 10 years at the helm, I decided for reasons towards better sustainability for the theatre, to step away from the Fugard as its full-time MD in January of this year. Sadly, one of the very first consultancy efforts I executed was to help the Fugard Theatre management work out how to best respond to the pandemic, which has had devastating consequences, not only in our communities, but within the theatre and arts sector specifically. Independent theatres, of which there are several in South Africa, while differing from organisation to organisation, by definition are independent. They are free from cluttered councils, mismatched boards and unnecessary committees. The result most often is a good measure of creative autonomy and creative freedom, all of which leads to the potential for creative excellence and the creation of meaningful job creation. The Fugot Theatre as an example of one of several excellent independent theatres in South Africa has very sadly and as a direct result of the pandemic and the complete lack of any meaningful supportive response locally had to make the brutal decision to mothball indefinitely. This has resulted in the immediate closure of the theater, the ceasing of all its operations, the retrenchment of 22 full-time staff members and the loss of hundreds of part-time contract and fixed term employment positions on a yearly basis. As an independent theater, 
The Fugard employs hundreds of people per, per annum through its operations and various production. Positioned in the inner city of Cape Town, the very establishment of the Fugard brought plenty more business in over the years. When the Fugard was first opened in 2010, there was barely a handful of retail, residential and commercial enterprises in the immediate three kilometer radius. Over the following decade, dozens of businesses creating hundreds of jobs opened and flourished in the immediate and surrounding areas. Over a relatively short period of time, the Fugard grew to be one of the premier theater destinations in South Africa, with an annual footfall of some 150,000 visitors, including high turnovers during the so-called tourism season and a reputation of producing world-class work almost exclusively employing and showcasing only South African talent, the independent business of the Fugard soon gained a much admired reputation both locally and abroad, which in turn directly brought positive international investment into co-productions initiated by the Fugard. Much, if not all, of the success of this independent theatre is thanks to the gigantic financial efforts of one person. Mr. Eric Abraham was not only determined to create a theater space which recognizes and celebrates a remarkable South African and arguably one of our greatest playwrights, Mr. Ethel Fugard. But Mr. Abraham was also, Mr. Abraham also wanted to create a space which reflects and celebrates a shared common humanity so desperately needed in these increasingly divisive times, not only in South Africa, but around the world. Mr. Abraham's efforts ran into not only the tens of millions, but quite literally the hundreds of millions of rands. These efforts being totally philanthropic, which never, with never a cent being returned to him over the last decade to reimburse him financially. At the time of closure, Mr. Abraham had spent over 210 million rand to support the efforts of the Fugard Theatre which contributed directly to the remarkable and diverse cultural landscape of South Africa, his birth country. Additionally, the Fugard Theatre paid millions of rands over the last decade to the receiver of revenue. I'm somewhat laboring this point to illustrate what has been lost owing to the complete lack of supportive regulations or subsidy in the example of this particular independent theatre. We, all South Africans, have lost the efforts of one individual who chose to use his affluence on the efforts of enabling thousands of South African theater makers from actors and artists to musicians, designers, creators, writers, builders, technicians, and so on. These efforts put money in their pockets where meaningful employment opportunities in South Africa, in the South African theater industry are so very limited. The Fugat Theater, as an example of an independent establishment in South Africa, relied firstly on the commitment of Mr. Abraham, but also on the ability to trade at the potential of 100% capacity. The business of theater is tough enough as it is, with brutally tight margins at the best of times, gravely exploited when not enough people attend a production season. There is truly little chance for an independent theater to break even or even reach any measure of financial sustainability without the support of sponsorship, donations, grants or funding. This is especially the case in South Africa, where we as independent theaters cannot charge anything remotely close to an appropriate admission ticket price, despite our productions giving our international counterparts a serious run for their money. The current COVID-19 protocol for operating theater under the current lockdown level are so restrictive that for independent theaters and producers, it is utterly impossible to trade meaningfully. There is simply no realistic or practical option of success. It's a loss, loss business. And the job losses are starting to run into their thousands. Without meaningful financial support, critical stimulus packages and revised protocols of operation at these times, more independent spaces and others in South Africa, like the Fugard will simply shut down. They will have no other choice. And sadly, more investors like Mr. Abraham will be lost. We need meaningful support and we need it urgently. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, I would like to now speak on the independent producers and their contributions. Um, the sprawling dance and theater sector is made up of a complex network of um, contributors who are all interdependent to coexist. 
Um, and it's become very clear that there is a growing dissonance between the funded theaters in South Africa and the non-funded theaters. There, is, there seems to be no relationship between these two, um, unfortunately. Um, and we have to find a way for meaningful relation for forging meaningful relationships between these two these two entities. On my second point, the South African dance and theater sector relies heavily on independent producers to provide theatrical venues with a wide range of content. Um, it, a recent study showed that our sector consists more than 75% of independent producers and independent contractors. That is a massive chunk of our sector. Um, all of these people were left unbelievably vulnerable with the COVID um, pandemic, uh, not only for the artists, but for the whole associated value chain. Um, there are only a handful of people on stage that can technical equipment, publicists, graphic designers, security staff, there are loads of people involved in this in this value chain. And unfortunately, when the pandemic hit, all of these people were left vulnerable and had nowhere to turn to. Um, they have forged their careers and invested time in, in crafting these careers. And all of a sudden, they were completely vulnerable. Um, and then my fourth point, at current, there is no regulatory framework to place in place to protect these vulnerable freelancers or production houses. Um, absolutely no framework exists. What do we do with independent producers, in, independent uh, venues, independent um, contract workers when a pandemic hits? Um, our sector is unbelievably vulnerable to these things, and there was no no plan in place that addressed this. Um, on the next point, due to the limited profit margins that the sector offers, productions are often scheduled to overlap, producing multiple projects at the same time. The overall business approach is thus not a per project approach, but a holistic producing strategy, which renders project-based funding irrelevant as it is not a sustainable source of funding for independent producers in the long run. This, this is a massive problem for our industry because all the relief funding that has been made available is all project-based. And going forward, this is not a sustainable way to, to look at our industry. And we have to find new models uh, and new ways of sustaining the independent producers, theaters, and um, people who work in the industry in order to, to sustain it and keep it going. Despite several attempts and proposals to collaborate with state-funded theaters, VR theatrical and other independent producers have never received any support financial or infrastructurally from any state-funded theater. And as such, is, there is no working relationship between these entities. And this is another big problem that needs addressing. The state-funded theaters, if they could be turned into um, hubs where, which, into which independent producers can feed to generate work, that would be a sustainable model. But unfortunately, the, um, the independent sector and the funded theaters are functioning completely um, separately. And we, we need to address this in order to, um, to really look at, re look at our sector. Uh, as a case study, VR Theatrical, um, our company has a 5 million rand a year turnover, and we employ on average 150 independent contractors per year. Unfortunately, due to the lockdown, all our future productions were cancelled for this year. And it's now been eight months where we have had absolutely no income stream, no salary, and no way of, of, of staying alive. Um, in April of 2020, uh, the art theatrical applied to the DSIC for a grant and was granted 20,000 Rand in April of 2020. Unfortunately, as you can see, 20,000 Rand is, cannot sustain a company of this size. Is, are there no better ways of structuring this stimulus package in order to actually inject cash where jobs can be created and, and create a sustainable model? That's my question. Thank you so much. I now hand over back to Ishmael Mohammed. Thank you very much, Yaku. Thank you very much, Chairperson uh, and members of the committee. Uh,
I wish to dwell in South Africa. It has a 44-year legacy and Standard Bank as its longest and its primary sponsor. Now, apart from the festival's enormous legacy for developing the art in South Africa, the festival also contributes 98 million rand to the GDP of Makanda and 360 million rand to the GDP of the Eastern Cape province. Post-1994, we have seen several more festivals developing in small towns with the support from the corporate sector and particularly in this case from APSA Bank. And while these festivals have been creating employment opportunities for artists, its indirect benefit has really been to the towns that have benefited from the, from the GDP that stays behind from a festival economy. The Center for the Creative Arts at the University of KwaZulu-Natal has presented four annual festivals for, the la for more than two decades. The Time of the Writer Festival is a literary festival that takes place every March. The Durban International Film Festival takes place in July. The Jomba Dance Festival in August and the Poetry Africa Festival ended last week. Now, this year's Time of the Writer Festival was scheduled to commence on the very same day that the national lockdown was announced by President Cyril Ramaphosa. The festival shut down immediately, and it was the very first South African festival to go online on the very next day after the, 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 the national lockdown was announced. And since then, every other major arts festival in South Africa has also gone online. Now, apart from artists losing their income as a result of the cancellation of the festivals, it really is the towns in which these festivals are located that have also lost a significant GDP that is a spin-off as a result of the cancellation of the festivals. In a city like Makanda, which has an unemployment rate of 63%, the annual festival is a major source of income, not only for artists, but also for the temporary provision, uh, job provision for, for, for workers and the local citizens who at the most are unemployed during the year. The cancellation of the festival has also left all the casual employees who are dependent on the festival without any source of income. And these are not necessarily actors. These are cleaners who work in festival venues. They are stage hands. They are people who do sets and, and assist stage managers. Many of these casual employees are amongst the poorest of the poor in the arts sector, and none of them have been able to qualify for the arts relief fund. We have literally betrayed the poorest of the poor in our arts sector who literally keep the cultural identity and legacy of our country alive. Mr. Chairperson, Honorable Chairperson, while the festival have festivals across our country have re responded innovatively to the challenges of COVID-19 and have gone online to sustain the brand awareness and to create some form of economic opportunity for artists, the financial returns from online festivals is almost negligible. And artists had to be substituted by, be subsidized, subsidized by the festivals who automatically had to move into this mode of operation. There was no additional support from the Artists Relief Fund delivered to, uh, to, 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 to festivals who suddenly needed to transition onto an online platform. And it's not just because you have a little IT guy in your office who can suddenly turn things and make it online. There is a specific system that is required for online live streaming of the performing arts. While live, before, while live festivals are provided a dynamic opportunity for the disadvantaged community to access the festivals. It has always been through the free ticketing schemes that festival producers have introduced at festivals across the country. These very same communities who are indigenous communities who do not have access for, for, for tickets and have been accessing the arts have now been denied access to the arts because online festivals could not, ex uh, could not make, uh, access those particular audience due to the high cost of data. And because absolutely no provision was made to support festivals to be able to reach out to these indigenous audiences 
through provision of data or whatever, a sector of our society has literally been even more marginalized than what they've ever been before in terms of accessing the arts. We call on the select committee to note that whilst many festivals have moved online, the sustainability of presenting online festivals, the growing of equitable audiences for online festivals, the generation of content for online festivals, and the advancement of festivals in the fourth industrial revolution must become an integral part of an economic re recovery strategy for the sector. And it cannot be done by a bureaucracy without the engagement with professionals in the, in the, in the festival sector. It has to be done with their knowledge, with their expertise, and with their skills. We also call on the select committee to note the growing dissonance and distrust between the DAC and the theater and dance sector, as well as the festival sector, much of which my colleagues have already alluded to, and which has resulted from the DAC's failure at effective communication, poor administration, lack of accountability by several of its officials, a dismal understanding of the dynamics of the sector and how it impacts on the planning and the execution of a growing of South African festivals to assume the same gravitas as any other international arts festival across the globe. Mr. Honorable Chairperson, I wish to also draw an example of the frustrating inefficiency, incompetency, and inconsistency that prevails at the Department of Sports, Arts, and Culture. While the country was in a state of level four lockdown, and whilst employees across the country were regulated by the state, and I repeat that, were regulated by the state to work from home, the DAC officials insisted that all grant contracts must be physically signed and be physically delivered to its offices. I will repeat that again. Whilst society was regulated by the state to work from home, the DAC officials insisted that all grant contracts must be physically signed by signatories and be physically delivered to its offices. The DAC officials refused to accept any electronic copies, despite explanation that employees working from home as per government's national lockdown regulations, and that in some cases that it would be a risk to take a hard copy document from one person to another person, considering that this would pose a risk to signatories with comorbidities, was simply dismissed and ignored by this, by this bureaucracy that we have. Nevertheless, the Center for the Creative Arts at the University of KwaZulu-Natal complied. We sent an employee and risked that employee's health to go from one, of one home to another home and to the homes of the registrar, who is over 60, to get the document signed and to be returned to the DAC on time. Since July, the Center has not received the contracted funding. Inquiries to the DAC have led to feeble excuses of officials passing the responsibility from one official to another official. Finally, after four attempts at following up with the official and with absolutely no responses and not even an acknowledgement of an email, the matter was referred yesterday to the Office of the Director General and we received an acknowledgement that Dr. Cynthia Kumalo will be looking into it through her office. We are now awaiting a response. The Center for the Creative Arts, I wish to point out, Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Members of the Committee, is not the only arts institution that has experienced this high level of incompetence from the DAC officials. It is the norm in the arts sector, that it is the norm in the arts sector. It has become accustomed to, become, to receiving this kind of shoddy service from the DAC. There are several testimonies by artists across the spectrum on social media pages condemning the inefficiency of the department. We call on the Honorable Select Committee to note that in order for festivals to become economically viable and attractive to international audiences and to international producers who import South African productions for their festivals, local festivals cannot afford to be held hostage by DAC officials who wield such unnecessary power of ignoring correspondences, not engaging, or simply not doing their jobs. 
We call on the Select Committee to recognize the contribution of festivals to South Africa's economy, social development, promotion of cultural identity, and the advancement of the rights of freedom of expression and freedom of creativity, which are constitutional values and which are most celebrated in no other place other than at festivals. Further, we call on the Select Committee to note the impact of COVID-19 on the presentation of live festivals and that whilst many festivals have moved online, the sustainability of presenting online festivals, the growing of equitable audiences for online festivals, the generation of content for online festivals, and the advancement of festivals in the post-industrial revolution must also become an integral part of an economic recovery strategy to address the growing unemployment, growing disillusionment, and the increasing threat to career development in the creative and the cultural industries. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Thank you very much. We will now Thank move you. to our foot from the Baxter Theatre. Good afternoon, honourable members. Thank Good, you. Afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for allowing us this time. Um, and good afternoon to all my colleagues in the theatre dance community. Um, I have to say that in response to all the speakers thus far, all of whom I agree with wholeheartedly, uh, I, I understand that this must be a barrage of information um, and I think it's um, really because our sector hasn't been heard for so many years. And perhaps this can be theaters that are subsidized by uh, the department that get a hearing, um, but that all of us, the whole sector, and essentially the heartbeat of the sector, which are independent producers, NGOs, university theaters, um, get this opportunity um, on an ongoing basis to be heard uh, by the department and by parliament. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, professional theatres on um, university grounds. And I think that this uh, could possibly be a solution to a number of our issues that have been brought up today. Um, essentially in terms of making space available to artists um, and also having theatres which are um, supported uh, by the infrastructure of the university um, and HR departments, IT departments, et cetera, which might essentially save um, funding in the long run. I'm speaking on behalf of uh, the Theatre Dance Employers Association, South Africa, as well as the Baxter Theatre at the University of Cape Town. To give you some um, background to the Baxter Theatre, and I don't want to um, only be promoting the Baxter Theatre here. I'm speaking on behalf of all university theatres, but to give you a sense of what is possible from a university theatre, I'd like to fill you in a little bit about the nature of the Baxter Theatre. Um, to quote John Carney on our 40th birthday, 1980s, that would take the risk of presenting works by black artists. The Baxter Theatre became the only theatre that allowed the alternative voice to be heard especially from black communities. Because of the Baxter Theatre's fortunate location situated inside the grounds of the University of Cape Town, they could present and produce so-called protest theatre plays, both Cesar Banzi's Dead and The Island, played for many seasons at the Baxter Theatre to all the surrounding communities of the Western Cape. The Baxter Theatre created the Exchange Corridor with other main theatres in South Africa. The Baxter remains a cultural icon and one of the most accessible and inclusive theatres in the country, thriving on indigenous talent and creating uniquely South African productions by incorporating a wide variety of performing arts and catering for audiences that reflect all the demographics of South Africa. Well over 500,000 patrons attend over 2,700 performances annually, making it one of the busiest independent theatres 
in Africa. And I say independent, although we are semi-independent theatre, because just under 30% of our budget, of our operational budget, is paid for by the University of Cape Town. The Baxter Producers World Class South African Productions, which have won both acclaim and awards nationally and internationally, establishing itself as a leading producer of South African theatre. Over the past five years, the Baxter Theatre Centre has received 78 nominations and 30 awards for its productions across the globe, including two prestigious Scots Fringe First Awards at the Edinburgh Festival. Um, <coughs> the Helen Hayes Award for Outstanding Visiting Production. New work has traveled, new South African work by South African writers has traveled to nine countries and 14 cities in the past three years, five years, including international acclaim Miss Julie, Solomon and Marion, uh, John Carney's Missing, and a production of The Four. 6,500 senior citizens attend the Senior Citizen Program Morning Melanies per annum and the Zabalaza Development and Outreach Program has consistently demonstrated over the past 11 years that programs that serve as incubators and resource nodes for capacity development have the ability to change the face of an industry. Over 7,000 audience, member, audience members attended 41 productions in only 10 days during the Zabalaza Main Festival in 2020, just before the lockdown. 703 young theatre makers were afforded the opportunity to attend workshops in two, 2019 and 20, where effective and sustainable skills and employability are developed as part of the annual Zabalaza Development and Outreach Programme. I want to now move on to um, theatres on university campuses as a whole. We need to recognise that theatres on university campuses are important sites for the, genera for the generation of employment for graduates of the university and other graduates of organisations, NPOs and NGOs, which develop young artists and professionals. We need to acknowledge that these theatres play a vital role in the generation of new content, new young audiences, and the intellectualization of the arts. Indeed, artists working at these theatres are easily able to draw on the intellectual capacity of the university, and strong mentors are easily accessible. Theatres in these surrounds develop content which challenges the status quo and which asks important socio-political questions. Currently relevant themes around decolonization, whiteness, anti-racism, gender-based violence, and the environment, which are discussed in lecture halls, find their way onto stages of university-based theatres and are shared with thousands of audience members. These theatres provide work opportunities to young artists and graduates and to students who need part-time work. The economic, social, and educational role of these theatres cannot continue to go unsubsidized and must be included in the economic recovery and stimulus plan. The Baxter Theatre has a staff complement of 70 full-time um, employees and six, 65 part-time employees, whom we've had to keep on salary through COVID. This has been near to impossible we have struggled on every level in terms of fundraising and other means to keep our staff employed. Um, and we are, we are still in a position where, our, where we are, are able to pay these salaries, but we are really coming to the end of all our resources. We applied for funding in April. Um, we were turned down by the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture. We have a budget of 30 million rand a year for operational expenses and salaries. Um, even had we received the 20,000 rand from the department, it would have been meaningless. We received all of 10,000 rand from Western Cape government for the entire theater. And not only did we only receive 10,000 rand, 
but our Zabalaza funding for next year, 2021, was cut by the Western Province uh, Arts and Culture Fund by 25% because they had paid out in COVID relief. We are really sitting in a situation which is pretty dire. Um, and as you know, other theatres in Cape Town, as Daniel mentioned, a few got theatres closed down. We've managed to stay open. We're open at the moment to 50% capacity, um, which is really problematic. Uh, not only because we can't break even at 50%, but obviously it is very difficult to get 50% of audiences to the theatre because there is still fear around getting the virus. So our theatre seats a capacity between our five theatres to seats, 1,600 uh, seats in our theater, and we're not going to be getting 800 people. Really looking, we're really in a, a very tight situation. And as I've said, we have not been able to apply, or we've not received any COVID relief to keep our staff on salaries. Um, I wanted to refer to a, uh, in, an example of one of our productions, which um, was created with university graduates. Uh, this uh, was a production called The Fall, which came out of the fallist movement on the university campus. And we commissioned um, six of those graduates who had taken part in the decolonization movement um, on campus in their final year. We commissioned them to do a play about the experiences uh, around the fall. And that production became one of our biggest successes. In fact, one of our biggest successes in the last probably 15 years alongside Miss Julie. Um, it played to thousands of young audiences around the country and in Cape Town. And it went to the Edinburgh Festival um, where it won a fringe first and was then invited to several countries around the world. I'm mentioning this production because it was an attempt from our side to provide young graduates the opportunity um, to A, get work and be employed and B, to take what they had learned from a university environment and create that into uh, a theatrical production. Universities have this uh, ability to um, bring together young people and uh, relevant, uh, crucial subject matter and create um, a new South African work and to create uh, new audiences and excitement and, of course, contribute to, to South African branding of um, hosting young companies. And I know that this is the only way really uh, for us to go forward to all the state theatres as well as to some of the independent theatres and university theatres and in this way provide employment on an ongoing basis to young companies where they can develop their skills and develop their work. This is part of the new white paper and we'll mention it later when we speak about the white paper but it's certainly something that we um, see as a possibility and, and a solution in terms of going forward. Finally, I would like to ask, um, on behalf of all artists, I believe, um, for some kind of audit around the COVID relief funding that the government allocated to the art sector. We have not been in a position to see or we've not it's not been made uh, available to us and um, we are concerned in terms of where all the funding has gone um, and with that i'll hand over to my colleagues thank you thank you laura um, I would like to just bring the attention more into dance as something that I live for. 
Um, this year marks my 30 years in dance. And 20 year, 21 years ago, I created Buani Dance Theater as an independent dance company. For black young dancers to know that they have a space organization, even in these precarious times. As I know that the dancers livelihood is dependent on the existence of such companies. During lockdown, dance demonstrated its power to heal and unite people about the globe. It provided the much needed wellness and a moment to breathe when artists were feeling very vulnerable. Many of us formulated our careers in our backyards in the 80s, in the heart of apartheid South Africa, experimenting with movement filled with dust and smoke that was emanating from burning tires and tear gas, while dodging rubber bullets and chased by police dogs. In 2020, in our democracy, artists are still marching for their right to exist to dance even if it means repeating the territory beyond the rainbow nation euphoria, to challenge the department of sport, art and culture, to rethink and envision a model that will best serve the artist. What lies between possibilities and contradictions, between life and death, between rich and poor, between hell and earth is a dancer. Dancers are custodians of a nation's traditions and cultures, and in most cases, a mouthpiece for the marginalized. Much of dance created by independent artists and companies is as, response, as a direct response to human values and raising questions, creating a discourse and demonstrating clearly that our need for each other is fundamental and that a need for government support is critical. Ironically, during lockdown, dance dominated our screens and social media platforms. Brought monks and nuns out of their monasteries to dance to Master KG hit song, Jerusalem, responding to the widely spread hashtag Jerusalem Dance Challenge. International Dance Day 2020, a global celebration of dance created by the Dance Committee of the International Theatre Institute in partnership with UNESCO and is marked annually on the 29th of April. This year, it placed a spotlight on South Africa by selecting me as an author for a dance message that was translated in different languages and responded to by dancers and dance companies around the globe with dance videos gaining an overwhelming response and global success. It is dance we're leaning on even in this extraordinary chaos and disrupted period in our life. We already know that it is our sector that will continue to suffer as the last 26 years have demonstrated that even without COVID-19, the arts fraternity has always had to fight for scraps. Placed at the bottom of the chain with the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture still without a clear indication and plan as to how the sector will benefit from the much needed economic stimulus package. It is particularly disappointing, Chair, given South African dance international success, the recognition in the unique dance style and courage that our dance is still not valued at home. What is critical as a matter of agency is a, is a creative stimulus plan for the cultural creative economy that will get artists, theaters, cultural spaces and festivals buzzing with solid programs to keep the arts fraternity alive. We are a dancing nation. The power in the dance acknowledges many centuries of collective efforts, and that is something worth fighting for. The toy toy as a dance of emancipation, at least in its intention, it's not enough. We need as a matter of agency, a vision towards nurturing, supporting and sustaining the arts and artists. The, depart the dependence of contemporary dance on international donor community for support has given many dancers a lifeline. And we know that it is not sustainable without support from our government. Already the question that is asked by international donors is what is your country doing to support your art? Often the answer is nothing. At the very least, very little. International touring has kept many companies and independent dancers and choreographers alive, creating jobs and contributing to the creative economy. The closure of borders impacted negatively on many dancers and companies and most were forced to close down. The lack of government support for dance festivals contributed to the demise of platforms where dancers were able to demonstrate their creativity and development. 
One such festival is the Dance Umbrella, which was important not only for South Africans, but for the continent. We are asking our government to recognize the contribution of South African contemporary dance sector to the economy and its strong international reputation. We call on the select committee to note that South Africa's leading dance festival, Dance Umbrella, which has launched um, the international careers of all of South African leading choreographers and dancers, has collapsed due to unsustainable funding. We call on the select committee to note that the funding of a national contemporary dance festival and the re-entry of South Africa's contemporary dance sector into the international arena must be strategic aspect of the economic recovery and stimulus plan for the sector. I would like now to hand over to Petronel Bard. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. Thank you. Honorable Chair <coughs> Pitson, thank you for, for hearing us, especially when you're not feeling well. I wish you better, Ship. Yeah. Honorable members, I'm to speak on to the nature of cafe and dinner theatres, the opportunity of entrepreneurship it presents, and its impact on the South African economy. The effects of COVID-19 on this type of entrepreneurship and theatre, that is my initiative as a case study. It is a wonderful thing that South African theatre practitioners and entrepreneurs are gathering forces to form a united front and it puts us in a better position than ever before to work with government. And for this conversation, I just quickly want to shift the focus to the very practical option of theatre cafe culture, especially in our rural areas. In every town of our country, there are spaces that could be converted to pop-up theatres. It is an opportunity of entrepreneurship and community development like no other, especially in a time when larger gatherings are hindered. It creates the opportunity for communities to engage, very needed, to uplift the local artists, technicians, and creative workforces, and presents opportunities for our professional artists to assist and help design these spaces. It is a culture that countries like India has long since implemented with great success, and there are a few examples in South Africa, like Piridak Aces, Evita Seberon, and smaller festivals, the Fukama Festival that it initiated. In a country filled with creative diversity, this is something we should investigate and capitalize on. The effect of COVID-19 has been severe on the sector because restaurants are in truth the most commonly used spaces when touring the country, and most of them have been unable to operate many closed down. But it presents us with a unique opportunity now to develop new spaces like these, not only as restaurants, but also as theater spaces. Development like this makes sense because you do not need to build new structures per se, but by employing the expertise in our creative sector, just adapt standing spaces to theaters that could host a wide variety of genres from dance, music to theater and poetry. It also creates platforms for arts and crafts to be sold, for education, for our chefs, waiters, interior decorators. The list of upliftment is quite endless. In the process, we also give chance for local businesses to sell their produce, stimulating home industry, and that without the cost of very expensive buildings or infrastructure. It comes from the people, for the people, with some well thought out help from our sides. It is, after all, in our arts that we most effectively celebrate our diversity, more so perhaps than any other field, and I know this from, from the very practical side of being directly involved in a cultural forum in Mossel Bay, where I hail from. It was when I got involved with MOCA, Muscle Bay Creative Cultures Association, that I really connected with different art forms and practitioners from all over, more than just the Afrikaans cabaret scene that I come from. I know my colleagues will elaborate more on cultural forums and such, but I do want to strongly advise that these kind of initiatives are helped with legislation in the administration and application for funding. As a young artist, I literally phoned 1023 for numbers in towns of restaurants to perform, looking for platforms, so much that at some point 1023 phoned me to form part of a survey for them. From this, Geo Theatre Development was born under which I am chair of MOCA, part of the WCCC, involved like initiatives, new ones, COVID and beyond, originating from the Foxwood Theatre in Houghton, intending to uplift rural areas through various platforms, and I form part of the Garden Route Film Commission. The sector of the industry needs to help. Many artists would not have been able to apply for funding, for instance, not working with contracts. 
They need the thinkers, doers, passionate people of integrity to work with governments and organize our sector of the arts industry. I will always impart my experience here because I had to create something out of nothing so I can help young, talented minds with their back to the wall. Before I hand over to Ivit and Ismail to talk more on NGO, CBO and POB and the informal sector, let me summarize. Please note that cafe theatres, pop-up theatre and independent theatre companies in southern South Africa, particularly in townships and rural communities that have no proper theatre infrastructures, have emerged and been initiated by NGOs and independent entrepreneurs over the past numbers of years to advance entrepreneurship and innovation. And that the national lockdown has decimated most of these companies and hence the support for established and well-run scale theatre spaces in townships, rural and developing communities with the track record for artistic innovation, job creation and social development and must be supported by the econo economic... Honourable Chairperson, I'm going to be very brief on community art yeah. centres. We'll continue talking more about it. Community art centers have been in existence in South Africa since time immemorial, and they played an incredibly important role in the fight against apartheid, where these centers were used as a focal point to mobilize, to educate, and to raise issues on the plight of the community. In the past, the centers have also produced a lot of leaders and practitioners who are not just leaders in the creative industry but who through engagement in community art centers have become leaders in other sectors of our society. The apartheid government did not support community art centers. And as a result of them, many of them struggled. Those that stayed open did so because of the support of the international donor community that was supporting them in the fight against apartheid. The impact of community centers reflects, is reflected in various areas of our socioeconomic development of our community. We see how our, our community art centers work around issues of gender, around issues of drugs, uh, around issues of teenage pregnancies. Each of these issues are dealt with through our community art centers. Now, since 1994, the community art development policy was developed by the National Department of Arts and Culture. But we are still, 26 years later, still waiting to see those policies fully implemented uh, and provide a clear sustainable investment program for community art centers at neither, the, at, 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 sorry, at not even the national, provincial or local government level are community centers achieving what they ought to have been doing. But what is most difficult to swallow, Mr. Chairperson, is the following, is that community art centers, which used to run efficiently and effectively and community art centers, which are well known internationally for their struggle and their fight in the legacy against apartheid, no longer exist. Centers that have been part of our political and cultural legacy to a lack of funding have been forced to close in a new South Africa. And I'm referring to the Federated Union of Black Artists in Newtown. I'm referring to the Suhikwa Institute of African Theatre, the Mamalodi Theatre, the Cape Arts Project, the Maluti Theatre, the Olive Tree Theatre, the Station Theatre, and I could continue naming so many more of these community art centres that started off with a people's struggle that was committed to anti-apartheid legacies. And this government, through its inefficiency, has literally driven all these institutions into, in, 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 into non-existence. Now we need to note, Mr. Chairperson, that the closing down of these historical community centers is not only an indication of the DAC's incompetence, but it is an erasure. It is an erasure of an important part of our political memory and our political legacy in South Africa. And we call on this honorable select committee to ensure that the DAC delivers to the poorest of our poor cultural workers in our society whose livelihood and careers is dependent on how well these community art centers are run. It requires effective policy and government and governance, not just in theory and on paper, but to be implemented. It requires direct transformation through investment of skills and the furthering of education. It requires funding and financing. It requires provision of social security 
at these at these community centres. It provides it needs to provide local marketing development opportunities for the centres, and it needs to take these community centres into a space <coughs> and innovation. And to return to the question of COVID-19, it will require support to make these heavily neglected community centres safe places where communities can mobilise, celebrate the arts, and continue to use the arts for social and political agents. I hand over to Yvette. Thank you, Ishmael. And I pick up on your last comment there about the deep inequalities that uh, our country faces and still faces 26 years into our democracy. The inequalities that extend to infrastructure, to resources and skills, to income um, across the board. And because of these inequalities, we absolutely cannot have a one size fits all approach. And that is what we have been seeing in the so-called solutions that we've seen to in response to the pandemic at this time. Um, our policies and our practices and our relief programs need to take account of those who on the one hand might have resources and income and those on the other who don't. Majority. And at the moment, our, our policies seem to be informed by a creative and cultural industries approach, an approach that was designed by the global north, essentially for um, an industry that has a market um, and where those with resources can access creative products. And this approach completely excludes the majority who were already excluded under apartheid. So we have to have a new vision for the future. We have to have a vision for the future that takes into account human development, social development, economic development, educational development. It needs to be uh, very specifically targeted. We need to make sure that we have training centers, flagship centers in every province. And this does not mean spending all the millions of rand on infrastructure. Rather, it means putting the, the money into the people who need to run these places, who need to produce the arts. In the revised white paper, which will be spoken to in a moment, there are a lot of very important um, and practical suggestions as to how this can happen. One of these is the idea of 30 companies of eight to 12 members being supported with average subsidies of around 3.5 million, which is in stark contrast to the huge amounts that are spent at this time on the five theaters that are take up um, our, our public uh, spaces. So um, we, would, we would ask that the department really look to start implementing those parts of the white paper that they, can, uh, that they can do at this time without necessarily having to go through the legislative, legislative processes. Um, and we also ask that uh, consideration is giving, given to training and education on the ground. At the moment, as you've heard from various people, there is a brain drain that, can, that, that, that uh, happens within the arts. As everybody flocks to the two or maybe three centers where it is possible to earn some kind of living. We cannot have that as a future for South Africa. We need a, an equitable future for every artist wherever they happen to live in this country. And every child and young person, every adult in our country needs to have access to the arts wherever they are. That is the vision that we want to work together towards. And we believe that it is possible. And we as the sector are here to work with the department to make that happen. Um, and as Ishmael uh, referred to at the end of his, his uh, presentation also, the need for social benefits is really strong. We need to have a regulated um, industry. We need to have social benefits for our industry. We have waited 26 years for these things. We cannot wait any longer. So with that, I'm going to pass on to uh, back to Ishmael and to Lara to speak to the white paper very briefly. Ishmael, please unmute your microphone. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Honorable Chair, I'm going to be very brief about the what I need to say about the white paper is that when submissions were called for the white paper, I made a submission and 98% of what I suggested for the revision of theaters in South Africa so that they could be driven economically smart has been included in the white paper. Now for that, I applaud the DAC. 
I really do, I applaud the DAC for having listened, for having taken that into consideration. But what I wish to highlight is that I do understand that the implementation of the white paper is a long process and we respect that process. And we understand that it needs to go through the various mechanisms that it needs to go to. But there are two components to that white paper. The one is the legislative framework that will require legislation uh, changes around the Cultural Institutions Act and how cultural inst institutions function and, and how the funding uh, agencies function. But the other part of the white paper is practical implementation, which is visionary, which is smart, and which places the theatre sector in a viable economy that could become self-growing. And for that, one does not require to wait for legislative processes. It simply means that the DAC needs to be smart, recognize that, isolate that, and use that for immediate implementation. And I will leave it at that. <clears throat> um, yeah, we... I decided to give you more time to make your presentations because it happens really that you get uh, uh, this kind of opportunity where we meet with uh, artists, you know, uh, theater workers, and their representative uh, organizations. Um, so I'll give you more time and then I'll try to manage the question of answers and questions as we move forward. We, this meeting is supposed to end at 17 hours and some of our members have meetings at six. Uh, there's a joint standing committee around that time. Um, I'll give over to you at least this time, just be as brief as, as possible for those who are going to give inputs. We, we listening to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. I just want to clear. I was told that this meeting only finishes at six o'clock. Um, I just want to double check that. Noltando. Yes, Chair. The meeting is finishing at six. At yeah, it's six. finishing at six. But I'm saying there are people who will be attending from this meeting, they'll be attending another meeting at six. So as right. we yeah, as we share this time, we need to have that in mind also. Oh, um, good. But good. The, my idea is to give more time to, to our guests actually, and then we'll, we'll move in. Uh, over to you. Uh, if, if we could just give three minutes to the next speaker, then we can go on to the Q and A if that, if that suits you. Um, no, you can all present according to you know your your. We only have one speaker. Um, okay, no, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Then we will That's move good. on to Lazani, who will wrap up, and then we will go to the Q and A. Thank you very much. All right, thanks. Good afternoon, honourable members uh, of this meeting. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I have been. Uh, in this meeting to, to give account on our engagement with DSAC uh, from the start. And um, just to give a little bit of a background from uh, where I come from and why I'm involved in the, in the communication. Being involved in tourism as well, my partner and I were part of the global impact of, that the pandemic had since December already because we um, saw the impact in tourism. And from the first South African case that was recorded, things escalated really quickly to the level of lockdown. And then we realized that digital communication platforms would have to be set up immediately to get the correct information to as many people as possible in a timely manner. And this is when we started setting up um, channels for communication. We re realized that people in the creative sector will also no longer be able to work and would need to know where to get assistance and information about this pandemic and about um, their current situation. So that is how I got involved in the in the, the art sector um, as well as from my background. So the more we became involved creatives, if we don't consult with them directly, and then we set up uh, WhatsApp groups for different sector 
to assess with relevant questions, answers, news and updates, and to engage the sector from grassroots to businesses and to organizations. Um, through these conversations, we soon also realized that the communication from DSAC is not really getting through to individual creatives and to applicants and people who need the money. And most people are not, we're not even aware that there is, a, there is a relief fund available or that the deadline has moved or any other information that got through. Now, we were aware of it because we, we made an effort, our organizations made an effort to phone and find out and follow things. But the layman or the, the, the artist on the street and the artist that, that needed to know this did not know unless they were told by someone. Um, so to bridge this gap, our organizations, our organizations positioned ourselves to engage with DSA directly in order to provide the necessary information through our WhatsApp groups that we started. We have about a thousand people on our WhatsApp groups and then more people within um, the tourism sector who happens also to be in the arts. Our engagement with, with the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture started out to be very fruitful and positive um, and two-way conversations. But as time went by, this became, the engagement became more and more difficult. <clears throat> it became more difficult to sit down and actually talk about what it is that we would suggest or um, to be consulted. We, we have tried to motivate consultation with the sector before making a decision and, uh, and or an announcement on any relief fund so that we can assist in the process and get the money to those who urgently need it. As a result of this, there were three sector meetings throughout this entire year. On 6th of May, as but this, this you'll know, so I'm just going to su summarize it from our perspective. On the 6th of May, the meeting was to explain the first wave relief fund and how it is working and how it is evaluated um, in that meeting. On the 6th of August, we were uh, called to ask to give input on the second wave relief fund. However, by this time, the relief fund was already drawn up and all organ the organizations had absolutely one day to just give their inputs and their suggestions for a relief fund that was announced two days later. So we feel that that was not proper consultation and that was too little time for us to say um, what the biggest issues were and they were mentioned before in this meeting today like tax and Karabo has mentioned a lot of these challenges. The last meeting was on 6 October. Uh, which we will discuss today, and that was to present the presidential, presidential economic, economic stimulus program. With regard to the specific the theatre and dance sector engagement, our first request to, to be included in any relief for theatres was sent by email on August 4th, which was um, acknowledged and replied to. Since then, we have engaged with feedback on all levels, from email to phone calls to public Zoom meetings where a representative was sent, but never. There were never any conclus conclusive answers given in these meetings or um, in any phone calls or emails. And since the 4th of August, we have requested 11 times on different announcements made by the president and the minister to engage and, insist and assist um, in, in a recovery plan for our sector. Our latest request for a meeting was because we did not agree that the theatre and dance sector is catered for in the Presidential Economic Stimulus Program, and that there is confusion within the department on where the sector fits in, especially in terms of relief. When we asked in our last meeting um, where, on the 6th of October, where we as the theatre and dance sector can go to find out how to apply, um, how to go about it, how to give input, we were referred to the NAC, and upon contacting the NAC, we were referred back to the DSAC, and after numerous emails and engagements, we were now granted a meeting on Thursday, 22nd of October, um, which is uh, after this meeting naturally. So um, as mentioned earlier, we, have, we are sitting here today because we have engaged on numerous levels with DSAC as well as with CISA, and it was not fruitful as there were no transparent communication on how public funds have been distributed and how they will be able, how um, CISA as on their own will be able also to assist in this, dire in this time of dire need. We feel that neither DSAC or SIFSA understands the theater and dance sector, nor are motivated to give it the proper attention to an econ economic recovery and sustainable growth plan. We have pushed for proper communication and offered to assist with proposals, databases, and anything that is required to expedite the process, but it has fallen on ears 
that seemed not willing to listen. And a memorandum uh, was even handed, hand delivered to the president in which the theater and dance sector was addressed. And we need to start a recovery plan right now or we will lose our theater sector as it is was explained today. We call on a ministerial task team as um, the arts really stretches over different departments as mentioned to work with our sector to come together and build a sector which can be the foundation to build brand South Africa. We can take our cultural, creative culture into the world and we can be the foundation of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair, for um, extending our presentation time. I do would like to request that um, we submit to you our recommendations in writing for your considerations. Uh, I did type them out, but I won't uh, spend more time on this in order for us to get to, um, to questions and answers, which I'm sure you, you would like to get to. Uh, would it be all right for us to submit our recommendations in writing? Um, thank you very much. Uh, let me welcome all the inputs uh, made by the by the, the presenters, uh, the artists, um, and that uh, um, it's uh, it really it, it hasn't happened in a very long time for me, and I think even for members of this committee, the the the, the, the select committee, to meet with artists though in a virtual meeting like this one, it will be nicer, uh, you know to meet in a, under normal conditions or in a, you know, like natural feedback where people could sit down in one place and chat. You know, there is more in body language than, more even, more in body language than what is said in the, you know, the, 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 the way. Um, and uh, we, all of us here must admit that this meeting is long overdue. We should have met long time ago. Um, so as to chat, so as to chat a way forward. Because you see, the problem with the with the with creative with the creative uh, uh, sector like yours is that people get involved in production as individuals in some instances. And of course, it takes even more than that, more than one person as you go on. But uh, in most cases, it'll be individuals and small groups. And um, and uh, what we interact with as members of parliament, particularly as the select committee in the NCOP, we look at what is happening in provinces. How does this impact on the on the creative art? you know, the creative sector in Limpopo, how does it affect people in the, you know, artists in the Eastern Cape and all the other provinces, province by, by province. And then with the National Assembly, they look at, you know, the, the overarching issues that affect the, uh, this and actually even link it with, you know, uh, helping society, us as South Africans, to solve our own problems and chart our own way forward in terms of what kind of development do we need as a country? Where are we heading to? Um, we know and we admit that uh, not, all, or not all politicians are artists. But at the same time, we know, I know that very well that many Many artists are politicians, but not all artists are politicians anyway. But many of them, many of them are politicians. Um, they see things that we as normal people do not, you know, what will take us an hour to explain. For people in this industry, it may take them three minutes to explain something that will take me two to three hours to explain. So we need to meet each other halfway. But more, we have an obligation as the government, for instance, to give support service and to make conditions conducive for people to be involved in production at that high level. And 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 again, that we there are spin-offs from these creative artists in terms of the amount of 
marketing that they do for this country, putting South Africa in the, on the international market. What is this that we are, we are doing, for instance, to, to give them courage to continue doing that and help to build this uh, country? Uh, the struggle to build <clears throat> a nation in South Africa. We usually don't say, what does it take to do that? What are the building materials that we need and what are the kind of workers that we need to do that? We are meeting with them today. So <clears throat> I think our, what, do, what, what members will do um, after this is to ask questions and then after that, the department will answer some of the questions. And we know that some of these questions cannot be answered in this meeting uh, uh, because of some information and statistics that might be needed. So I'll take this as the beginning of a, of a long process of meetings, of your future meetings to come where we as the committee can meet with your representatives, including the parastatals that are supposed to be giving support service to you as artists, and then say, how do we close that gap between those who are providing a service and those who are receiving that service, and us as society, the service that we receive from, from the artists. Um, so I'll give over to members to ask questions and the department will answer. And then on the way forward, we'll look at what else can we can be done, like including those, um, uh, these presentations being, you know, written down and, and um, yeah, and then later we can get the answers in writing. And then we can have another meeting where this report will be given, where there will be way forward in terms of what can be done and by when it will be done and what cannot be done, you know, in that, yeah. Uh, that, is, that is the little bit from me. Honorable members, there's the input. Um, are there questions that members would like to ask? Uh, yeah. Chaperson <laughs> Mbulelo can I just make an interjection? Let me just recognize the hands that I, um, I see. Honorable Gillian, and then there's uh, Christians. We are from Bulelo Baja. Yeah, in that order, those are the the hands that I've just seen now. Um, honorable, uh, yeah, Honorable Gillian or Honorable Baja, you wanted to say something before. Oh, Morinche Gillian. Yes, yeah. I just wanted to it's not get into the discussions. Um, but I think honorable, that honorable uh, for Baza. me, it's important for uh, we start with the debate or discussion. Uh, there are things that I know. Yes, I would have. Uh, I wanted to request that the department comes in first so that they are able to tell us what has been resolved and what has not been. So that as we get into the actual debate, we know what it is that we must engage on and what the department has already um, corrected or embarked on. That was just my suggestion, Chair. Chairperson. Um, there's a suggestion from uh, Honorable Baha that let, <coughs> let us uh, let us let us give the department to present as a respond to some of the questions and then we fill the gap. Your hand is up. Chair, I've got a different view. <clears throat> my view is that um, if you allow me to give my input and then I will give my view on the way forward. Now we're talking about approach to the meeting. What what you're saying is that we ask questions. We don't follow what yeah, Baha is My view is that there were so many allegations against this department that I think an hour is not enough for engagement. 
Now, um, my suggestion will be, Chairperson, out of this meeting, that a memorandum must be um, drawn up to give the department the opportunity to answer us on paper, and then after that, go into another discussion with the department where the minister and the deputy minister are present, Chair. Yes, Comrade Gillian, so that we, we are all together. Actually, what you, are, you and Baha say more or less the same thing, that uh, there, is, there won't be enough time, for instance, for us you know, to, to, to engage with these matters. Now, what I think we should do, um, the, we can either, no, let's let the, the members ask the questions. All of yes, us, we ask the questions. We com can I can I just uh, finish, uh, Honorable Gillian? That uh, all members will ask, ask 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 the questions and then comment, and then after that, depending on what time is left, uh, obviously we're not going to get the answers in one sitting today. That is that is just clear from the the intensity and the depth the depth of the of the questions that are asked. Some, these questions are pregnant with meaning. These are not just innocent questions. We're talking to people who feel uh, aggrieved, who feel uh, ignored. And, um, and of course, we come from a, a crisis situation of COVID. And it's not even, we are still in the middle of that crisis of go, going towards an end. Um, as we are now in lane level one. So I'll ask that uh, uh, Honorable Bach and members, let us all ask questions. And then from there, we can let the department uh, respond. And then we'll chat a way forward in terms of how are we going to deal with this matter going forward? Is that in order, Honorable Members? I suggest that we yes. take that way. Yes, it's fine. Okay. Um, yeah, great, Yeah. Um, can I then start with you, Honorable uh, Gillian, because your hand was up first, followed by Christians and then Honorable Bacha. Thank you, Chairperson. And let me welcome the inputs made by the sector this afternoon. Chairperson, allow me to apologize <coughs> that I. Um, sign in late in this meeting, but I was a bit older by the doctor. But not to worry, I'm still fine. During COVID-19, Chairperson, in this country, the inequalities throughout society was highlighted. And also throughout the sectors. And in our last engagement, with this department, the minister and the deputy minister, I was one of the persons asking the question about the artists, because the artists were in the streets. And we received um, answers on um, what the department is doing <clears throat> to assist this artist during COVID-19. Now, Chairperson, if we look into the NDP, the NDP outlined that sports, arts and culture is a, this sector is central to the country's nation building and social cohesion. But what I've heard today is the opposite when we hear the, to the treatment that the sector is receiving. This sector chairperson is contributing 1.7% of the country's GDP. This sector is contributing 7% of the national workforce in this country. <clears throat> now, sitting here, listening to a contributor of 1.7% to GDP, 7% of the workforce of this country, I am so disappointed. 
And I can also feel the disappointment of the sick. I also need to to wreck the financial side of government. We are in dire strait financially in the country, but I don't think, Chairperson, we are in that situation that a sector that is contributing its country's workforce can come to this meeting and to the select committee this afternoon. And it's a person that the sector throughout the years, I must agree, was low on our um, contribution towards them. And I was sitting here and I was listening, I was asking myself, The relationship between the sector and this department there is definitely something wrong. There is definitely something wrong between the sector. Also, Chairperson, I was very disturbed in the sector at the height of the pandemic to go physically into offices while we are also in the fourth industrial revolution. And that is one of my main concerns. What went wrong there? What happened there? And I've got so many questions, Chairperson. After listening to this input, I also know, Chairperson, that the department's budget has been cut out sector in the procurement of PPE and all those things that the country needed at the stage when we're in the height of this pandemic, really asking that this department must put answers to all allegations that was made by this sector to us on paper. Because we can listen now to answers, but I need to see it on paper because I must study it, Chairperson. We can't just accept any answer. You know, Chair, if we want to build social cohesion in this country that is so needed, it's so much needed. And if really, Chairperson, the nation building of this country is a thing, the NDP is clear, and the NDP is giving us this guidance that we must respect the sector. And we must try at all means to assist the sector, Chairperson. That um, I, I don't have questions. I want to, I will wait for the answers on all those allegations, Chairperson. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Honorable Guido. Um, yeah, it's a very sad feeling indeed. Um, uh, Honorable Gilman uh, Christian. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Chairperson, I would like to say, first of all, that my knowledge of the arts industry is very limited. So I really welcome. Um, uh, just, 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 uh, just, 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 um, Honorable uh, uh, Christians, can we lower the hand of uh, Baxter Theatre? Or, yeah, or, yeah, all right, thanks a lot. You can continue. Uh, Chairperson, my knowledge of the arts industry is very limited, and that is the reason why I really appreciate the presentation that was done by everybody. The planning was well done, and I think we have a very good understanding of what is currently happening in the sector. Um, what I heard today um, was indeed, as Honorable Gillian said, extremely um, concerning and worrying for the sector and for the department. Um, we received a lot of information, um, as Lara has said, and, but what stood out for me is that um, this is a sector on the brink of collapse. I think the sector is in real trouble. Now, the failure and collapse of this industry, for me, will see so many other programs failing. Um, it's not only South Africa's tourism, it's people's livelihoods. 
um, educational programs, um, art and culture, does not see that what is happening here has a ripple effect on so many other industries. I would also like to say that it is disappointing that the minister is unable to join us today, um, understanding that he has another program, but I do believe that we need to follow up with him and um, you know that we need to pre do these presentations with him again so that we can get a way forward. Now, Karabo, what stood out for me there was you saying, you know, and I heard from you that you said that you have no one listening to the cries of the industry, meaning that the department has also dropped you. It's an entire sector that seems, as I've said, on the brink of collapse. I have a few questions and statements to both the department and um, to the people who, are pre uh, who have presented. Now, from the department side, what is the reason for the department's lack of communication with these stake stakeholders? It seems that there have been um, numerous times that the industry has reached out, but that the department has been unable to give them any true answers. Then chairperson from our side as the select committee, I would like the chairperson to write a letter to the minister on behalf of the select committee to call on him and the department um, to call on the minister and the department to come back to the select committee and to present their plan to us to save this industry. These presentations must also be shared with the minister. Um, then also, I would like the department to come and give us a briefing of the audit report of the COVID-19 relief funding. I think that's very important at this stage. As Honorable Gillian has said, there's lots of allegations being made. So I think the audit report will indeed give us a way forward. Um, another thing that has come up is um, what kind of money has been allocated to the sector uh, to come and present that to us as well when they come. And then to Jakob van Rensburg, um, he asked a question, he asked if he should submit his recommendations to us and to the department. The answer to that would be yes, it would be a good way going forward, submit those recommendations to us and to the department. Um, and then just lastly, um, I would like to hear from the department, what plan do you have on the table to save these people's livelihoods? And by plans, I mean um, the money set aside for salaries, for keeping the doors of theaters open, um, for paying their bills, etc. What plans are on the table to actually assist um, everyone? And then as far as the allegations are concerned, just to um, one of the members that have spoken to, uh, sorry, I just want to get to the page, to Ishmael Mohammed. Now, you have mentioned there that um, you spoke on matters of corruptions within DSAC. And I don't know if we have enough. Has this in um, action by DSAC and their failed case against you impacted on donor funding, um, the morale of staff and the reputation of the Market Theatre Foundation? And I would also be interested to know, is this same council still governing the Market um, Theatre Foundation? I have another question with regard to Ishmael Mahmoud, but I think what we should do is to put all these questions on paper. This will not be our last engagement with, the, with all the members on this forum. Thank you, Chairperson. Honorable, um, 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 <laughs> Mr. Mahmoud, the... Let's give the, the members a chance to ask questions and then we'll invite you, uh, you. to ask further questions later and then, you know, the department will respond and then we'll sure. come up with a way forward where to from here. Um, who, is, who is next? It's, um, it's, it's honorable. It's, it's me, uh, it's, it's Baha. Yes, uh, Baha. Baha. Yes, Ngosi, uh, Ngosi Slalo. Uh, let me apologize for not having my video on. Um, I'm sitting outside uh, just to be part of the meeting because I'm struggling to connect uh, in my house. Um, Chairperson, firstly, let me say 
I, I think it, it's very important to see that uh, there's a team that has come to the fore to present what they see as something that is not sitting well with them. Because at least we see that uh, it's different people, different backgrounds, but people who share a similar pain. And they thought that it's important to come to parliament and kind of share um, their problems with us. I think that must be welcome. Secondly, Chairperson, I think that for me, um, it, it would have been important to hear what the department has to say about the strong allegations that are made um, by the team that has just done the presentation. So that we are in a position to see whether there is work being done in order to address the problems that uh, are, are put forward to this committee or, or not. Because Chairperson, I think that these are serious allegations that are being made before us. And therefore, for me, it says that there's a need to hear what the department is saying. Firstly, Chairperson, if you look at, at what uh, Mr. Ismail Mohammed and uh, Karabo Hokong was raising, those are it, it's serious issues, which require that uh, there must be something done in order to, to address them. For instance, Chairperson, um, how is it the responsibility of each subsector to provide protective equipment for artists? What is the department doing in order to provide support to such? Um, when they, uh, there's, they, there's a, a cancellation of projects due to lockdown um, because of funding or non-funding thereof, what is put in place in order to assist those um, artists who were going to perform um, in, in such. Um, and I mean that there's, there's a lot of destitute individuals who are in this particular sector. What has the department done in order to assist people? Because, you know, we've been getting reports that a lot is being done to assist um, artists and we're given numbers. And yet there's a huge number of people who are represented today in this particular meeting who have not gotten anything from, from the department. Now, now I, I'm, I'm of the view, Chairperson, that um, I, I think I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm covered um, by um, member Christians um, to say that there is a need we made and for that sufficient it, a kind of um, in when we felt that there was a lot to be done I know that uh, however it doesn't give anyone a chance to do as we wish in terms of assisting people we can't pick and choose who to assist we must assist everybody equally and so I'm saying, Chairperson, that uh, for me, it would be important to get a sense of what the department is saying, and, and, uh, and then we take it from there. I, I've decided not to ask the questions that I had, because I think that it, what I've just said would kind of assist us in moving forward. Thank you, Chairperson. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks a lot. Uh, Thanks a lot, Honorable Bach. I think the, the feeling really, it's, uh, yeah, we all feel the same, more or less, yeah. And uh, that this can never be enough. We really need enough time, um, you know. Uh, and I think this, the today's meeting is the beginning of many meetings to come. And, and this time, we're not going to leave uh, we're not going to leave this sector in our meetings when we meet. Either we meet with them before or we meet them jointly with the others. Um, it, will even, it will even be nicer in the future 
that we should have a joint sitting with the NA to discuss this matter, you know, uh, of this sector. That, that's how that's how that's how serious we take this uh, um, encounter today. I mean, this exposure. Ooh. We knew that there were problems here and there, but I never knew that it is to this level because I always check we spending this money on this, and you know, are we getting value for the money that we're spending uh, in this uh, in this uh, in this sector? Um, yeah, uh, are there further uh, questions that members would like to to ask? I'm looking yes, at the uh, yes, Honorable Gillian. I raised my hand because there was one issue that I missed, Chairperson. Um, okay, you be. Can I you ask? Yes, yes. Thank you, Chair. Chairperson, just just the, the the last one is something that I've also noticed coming from the Western Cape. Um, and representing the Western Cape in the NCOP. I noticed that most, there was a lot of presentations done by the Western Cape in the sector. But the one issue that stood out and um, that I need the department also to answer on is that that allegation that was made that 20,000 was promised by the minister, but from the Western Cape government, the sector only received 10,000. I think that is also something that needs to be looked into. And I want to also still stand with my proposal that if the department don't have enough time to answer, because I think they must answer all allegations that was made, if there's not enough, enough time, that it must be on a memorandum and it must come to us in writing as members of the Select Committee. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks, Honorable Gillian. Um, the, there are more questions. I don't actually even want to repeat some of the questions asked by the, uh, the activists in this sector. Because some of their questions are actually my questions. Some of their questions are our questions. Uh, the issues of the theaters in Limpopo and other provinces that don't have such. There have been promises about those over many years. But when you look at provincial um, budgets, they don't budget for, they don't budget for what they, what they say in them by word of mouth does not talk to the budgets that they draw. In many instances, the, the departments in provinces don't even budget properly for their for their events. They'll put the events on the on their on their PPA, you know, on their program, but not allocate funds for them. And towards towards two months towards the event, then I'm told that then they start applying for funds from the national department. So the provincial departments also must take responsibility for the for the part that they are supposed to play as as, as provincial departments. And in that way, uh, as members of the NCOP, we need also to engage with the, the provincial departments through the portfolio committees in the provinces to ensure that uh, you know this kind of mistakes that happened some years ago do not repeat themselves. Um, are there further questions from the members? Um, no, sir. Let's hear from the department. Yeah. Uh, now I'll give over. Um, I've seen uh, there was a hand from, is it Lara Foot or what? Yeah, yes, sir. Lara Foot from the Baxter Theatre. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I just you, wanted. Uh, thank you. You wanted to say something before the department yes. could respond. Yes, I, I okay. just want to pick up on something on on two or three things that I think are very important. I'll be very brief, um, and it's I think because we're finally being heard. Um, the one is uh, uh, SIFSA. Uh, we feel that SIFSA is a smokescreen between um, 
leadership in the arts community in theater and dance and the department. So the department speaks to SIFSA, but there's also money involved. And we feel that that's uh, somewhere not right. So uh, the real leadership of the arts sector are not getting to speak to parliament and the department. And this is the first time we've had that opportunity. There have been ir irregularities for several years that we've all been concerned about, primarily some of the state funded theaters not presenting any work and not, and not employing any artists, but rather standing empty and administrators getting salaries and, and, and millions being, being wasted. The other, the other thing that I wanted to bring up is the Theatre Dance Employers Association met with the DG twice, very positive meeting where he asked us to uh, find two representatives from every province and to speak to employers of artists across uh, the country and come back with statistics and graphs, which we did very promptly um, and, and waited for our next meeting. And the DG passed us to the deputy DG and we waited for, for nearly three months to get a meeting. And this was all over the COVID period. Uh, Laura, yeah. excuse me. May we at least say that we, 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 let's give the department a chance to respond because we have only 30 minutes. Okay. And then, um, and then some of those questions that you would like to, we're going to come up with a way forward. And okay. part of the way forward will deal with some of the issues that we have talked to. Thank you. Uh, yeah, can we give the department a chance at least to respond in this 30 minutes? We know that it's not enough time to respond. So we'll, we'll find a way of, uh, uh, yeah, getting, getting those answers at a later stage. Over to you, uh, Gigi and, and your team. And I must also, I, I, I forgot to explain in the beginning that some of our members, even them off sick today, but some of our members were in a bus from, from the hybrid meeting uh, in parliament in route to their villages. And some of the villages have a particularly um, Acacia has uh, connectivity challenges. But uh, anyway, um, let's give over to the DG and the team to, to quick respond, and then we'll come up with a way forward. Thank you, DG. Uh, thank, you, thank you very much, the Honorable Chairperson and the, the Honorable Members. Uh, maybe I must start by saying that uh, the issue of uh, giving us a chance of a right of reply um, will be really appreciated and suggested that you will be given an opportunity. Because when we looked at the agenda for today, we were not uh, uh, there or included. So some of the responses we'll present uh, for now is to take the opportunity that the honorable members are giving us but hoping that there will be time then that will be coming here well prepared. We will do our best honorable chair to respond to some of the issues. Some of the issues that have been also highlighted by the honorable member. Just uh, indicating that uh, with what uh, I think with maybe what uh, in particular, because uh, Mr. Ishmael has made inaccurate, if I can put it politely. First and foremost, the issue of state theaters, as has been indicated, that uh, since 1994, nothing has been failed. I did and constructed in Northern Cape. And that theater is in existence. And there's not a pre apartheid theater. The issue of the Limpopo theater, the department has taken pains to engage with the Limpopo province, make the funds available. What the issue of what we call 
uh, the process of doing feasibility plans is to be done in that way. The challenge is there, which will provide detail. Step in about the issue of land ownership. Not because there was no money provided. We'll give you figures of the money provided to do this feasibility and ensure that there's the local provision. Now, he also further argues around the issue of people having to come to the department during lockdown. The department decided, as part of its relief fund, to have what we call digital application where the creatives were going to be assisted to make sure that they can be able to have their crafts displayed and exhibited and shared through online. And the applications and the contracts were submitted electronically. The People would scan those applications, those contracts that we send to them, and then they will forward them to us. So during the relief fund, those contracts were done in an electronic mode. I will, Honorable Chair, have to then investigate under what terms and the, in which, as he has given the example of who and how and when was that person forced to submit at the height of COVID when our own officials were not even supposed to be here, except a few that we were working with day and night to try and make sure that relief fund is accessed. But I'm sure he will give me those details and then I will engage with the officials that he is referring to so that I can be able to address that matter. Because exposing any South African to pandemic would not have been the right thing to do. But my understanding is that with the digital application, people were submitting their contracts electronically. We were sending them electronically. So it will assist me before we come back to this meeting to the, to the select committee that we are provided with that. He further alleges that private sector is funding festivals and not this department. In his mention of APSA to the issue of National Arts Festival, I can be on record check that that festival is funded by this department. The online thing it is talking about as a trendsetter was through the funding of this department. But for purposes of amnesia and intention to tarnish this department, he uses the very same festival we fund as a festival that is funded by Standard Bank alone. We have festivals that are well known throughout this country, funded by this department. To mention a few, Chairperson, the Inipos Festival, Buele Kaya Festival, Ebu Beleni Festival, Makufe Festival, the Cape Town Festival, International Jazz Festival. Even at the time when they were faced with COVID and uncertainty whether this will happen, we still provided the funding. And we engaged with the organizers to make sure that that money reaches those who were already scheduled to perform. Yet here he comes and tells the public and South Africans that South Africa, this department does not fund festivals. 
mapungufu we festival. The standard bank in South Africa. The Cape Carnival, that happens. The Muratile Festival. He has been working for this department uh, entity for years. Is he really having a meeting? He made the feather makes allegations. Honorable Chair, in this meeting, all the so around the issue of this department and its cultural institutions. But he has been part and parcel all about what they are getting, getting support and huge funding, even for the renovations of that market place. The windy brow that we put under him. Is it really a meet or is it something else that I'm dealing with here? Now, Honorable Chairperson, the issue of SIFSA has been raised. My colleagues were created. Now, we will provide you with a historical background why you see such came into it was not necessarily by this department this was a consequence of an engagement when the too many voices of the sector came to the fore to say government we need support and they met with the former president and they all agreed on a need to have an organized where there can be a way in which to engage with government. So collectively, even today as we meet here, the colleagues who are here are not the only ones who have been meeting with the department. Because of a number of creatives, even a number of organizations that are there, some at national and some at provincial level that we have a desire to work with, but have a way in which we can be able to have an entry point of an organized sector. So the challenges with CIFs, we have now said that it has been smooth in itself. But the idea was to make sure that there is a collective voice when government engages with the sector, not to muzzle other sectors or subsectors. Even today, it's not the intention for us to do so. But we do need a collective voice. Now, Chair. The issue that has been raised around communication. President, after the president that indicated that the country is facing pandemic, immediately the minister met with both the sector representatives, and that was in March, and the sports on the same day because of ages of the met met the first group in the morning and met the other group in the afternoon. And the ideas about the relief and how we can implement it, in fact, arose from there. To say, how can the department assist us? As if that was not enough, at least one of the colleagues who has just spoken here indicated other meetings we've held with the set. However, we have always said it is impractical to implement 
all ideas. We need to look at pragmatic ways to respond to the COVID. Shall we can't say we had plans before COVID happened. We'll be lying to this community. So when Ismail talks to the issue of the plan, we did not have plans before COVID because we did not know what we face. But after that engagement, we came with the strategy that we felt to support as many creatures as possible. We had to reprioritize the bison. When the minister instructed that you really look at everything that you are going to do in the first quarter of the financial year. Put that money in the basket for the next year. We looked at that and that is when we raised up in 50 million. As if that was not enough, immediately minister engaged with the to say this basket may not be right. Can you look at what you have and be able to assist this sector? Which, by the way, minister was very clear, it's going to face a long haul of the pandemic than any other state. For the reason, we even commissioned SACO to conduct the research on the impact of the state. So when this happened and the minister then engaged with the MEC, on their own equitable share, they set us but over and above that, we then approach children after we look at what is required. And Treasury agreed that from the grant we reprioritize for funds to support the state. But as if that was not enough, Honorable Chair, no. The department did not only stop there from engaging with the sector. Whether it was me, it were meetings held with me, or meetings held with the mini, or with the GDG. We went further and said, the sector said, department, how can we assist you when we're dealing with the first wave? So that at the end of the day, we are able to work in partner. Honorable Chair, we can provide you with names of even people who are involved in adjudication submitted by some of the sector organizations. But department itself is not even adjudicated. We appointed sector people, both for the adjudication and the appeal. It is income and misuse to say the word on the issue of efforts by the department to engage with the sector. And that the sector was not listened to. We provide this when the time comes, even on who I am in who was in that meeting. With the grant and the and I'm happy that the basket is here because they assisted me as to the state to have a session for the first time with the independent committee. And indeed, we had a lot of discussions and positive things. But at the time, the second, the already the first wave was done. So what we did, what we committed, the retention of jobs. 
as a call as an approach to save God. And that Jefferson is part and parcel of the employment stimulus as announced by the president. Based on what they explain to us, we factor that when we engage with both National Treasury and the project management office in the president. We said we cannot move the floor while the tap is running. So we agree we must create jobs of wherever we can, but we have met with the theater people as an example that I provide. And they've raised the issue that even if they are employing eight people or so, those people should be retained because trying to create new jobs when you are setting jobs does not make sense. And that was a point. But we could not make these announcements because when we started, everybody knew. Our so when the budget came back, when we had submitted plans and proposals to look into these issues, the budget that came back was hard. Even the period we're talking about at first was six months. Six months is impossible now because the issue is that you must spend the money by end of March. So honorable chair, we are not perfect. But to argue that we are perfect is disingenuous. We will continue even with the employment stimulus package. We'll present and submit as requested the elaborate plan that is there in this regard. And we are working here and we have briefed the sector on two occasions around the stimulus package. Even when the man came back now less, we called the meeting, we briefed the sector. So, Chairperson, for me, it will assist once we get these things to be able to respond and provide you with whatever you need from our side so that we are giving you a complete response on what we've been doing. The issue of auditing COVID fund. The president of this country was very clear and tasked the auditor general not to wait until things are finished, but to have what we call a special audit, which is ongoing. Honorable members and those who are here today presenting to you, they can visit the auditor general's website. We are there as a department. Currently, that special audit is going on. And that audit will be public, not by this department, by the Auditor General. So when there are allegations that are further extended towards the theater, state theaters, they table year after year annually their audited statement. The colleagues from them from the ads, I met with them. They love stream our streaming. I asked them, and I'm happy you are asking that Mr. Mohammed must give us this corruption. I even gave them any possible anonymous number, send us the alleged corruption, we will investigate. To date, I have nothing. Even when I said, then what is the reason when we met them again? And I, they indicated people might be victimized. Now, Honorable Chair, how do I deal with allegation of corruption when people are fearful? I'm still saying we are open. Otherwise, there is a hotline. 
so that we deal with corruption, because that is a cancer that this country is fighting. So I am welcoming chair, because I know of time. I just thought these issues I need to raise for now. But there have been very positive contributions from this team. Some of those who seek to have a constructive criticism with us and we are open to engage. And I think we will take also those to assist us, including what would be submitted as was suggested by uh, the presenters that they've got proposals. It only got a go ahead from parliament late last year. So before we could move with the rollout, which is what minister can confirm has tasked us to make sure as a priority, we implement the positive things out of the white paper that can be done now. I have a team that is working on that, on what could be done in the short term and in the medium term and in the long term. Because the revised white paper, we believe will transform the sector. And that rollout can't just happen by us alone. We will work with the sect because it must benefit the sect. So when colleagues talk about regulations, they are aware that the copyright amendment bill and the performance protection bill were referred back by the Honorable President for six areas that need to be addressed. Because those particular bills, we believe one of the things they will do, they will liberate the creatives. If we look at its, or their objects, those, <coughs> the copyright amendment bill, which are all, one of them is 1968, the other one is 1978, 167 and 1678. Clearly, they are pre democratic dispensation and they're at the core of how this sector, in fact, is currently functioning, resulting in a lot of exploitation of the creatives. So we believe that once it is finalized, it will create limitless possibilities and opportunities for the creatives in regulating the set over and above the revised white paper. So the issue of regularizing or regulating the environment for the creatives to flourish and thrive. The event of GDP currently has as per the research by 2018, it is important regulatory environment, which will minimize the exploitation. At the core, among them are these three pieces of legislation. I will therefore then chair for now on the issue of relations indicate that the relations are indeed having serious challenges with some of the sectors while we're working with others quite well. But it is something that we need to work harder because we as a department must also understand and accept that we exist for only one purpose, to service the sect. That is a reason to for our existence. 
So having a fractious relationship is not an answer. So we will commit, we are committing it, we will work harder to build that relationship with everyone in the state. Thank you, Chair. Chair, if I may respectfully request uh, that we give Mr. Mohammed two minutes just to respond. Um, would that be possible? I realize we are running out of time. Chairperson, where are you? Chairperson, have we lost you? It seems we have lost the chairperson. Okay, but um, it's five minutes past six already. Some of our members must leave for a meeting. And um, I don't think <coughs> if the members will allow me just to handle this last part as the chairperson is has lost his connection again. Member Dongeni, where are you? Are you still on the platform? Yes, sir. <clears throat> you can check. Thank you. Um, let me take the opportunity then to thank um, the sector who was in the meeting today. This the DG um, of this brand new department and all staff members. Let me also thank the members um, of the select committee for the inputs. And we're looking forward to our next engagement. And um, let me also then ask the department, if there's questions that wasn't answered, that feel free to send it to the committee um, secretary the answers you can send through. If there's any more questions of members that you feel was not answered, you can make contact with the committee secretary. And I, I must say that we can't allow any more inputs. We are already seven minutes over our time limit that was given to us by parliament. This meeting was supposed to finish by six. And it's seven minutes past six already. These members that must sign into another meetings. I thank you very much, everybody. Um, this meeting is adjourned. Oh, <laughs> thank oh, you. Oh, thanks, sir. I <laughs>